This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Braintree. Mobile app development can be complex, but integrating your payments no longer has to be. With Braintree, your business can accept nearly every type of payment from any device with just one integration. Learn more at braintreepayments.com slash knowhow. And by iFixit. Introducing the all-new ProTech Toolkit to give you the compact and complete toolkit for all things DIY. For $5 off your purchase of $10 or more, go to ifixit.com slash twit and enter the code knowhow at checkout. Today on Know How, turn your old Android phone into a security camera. Welcome to Know How. It's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I am Father Robert Balasare, and this is Brian Burnett. Hi, everybody. I'm Brian. <laughs> I can't do a Brian impersonation. How do you do that? <laughs> you just have to be kind of cool. You have to be yeah. kind of chill. You hey, should everybody. have a scotch in your hand. That, hey, that always helps. Okay. Yeah, there we go. No, of course, <laughs> this is not the cranky hippo. This is Aaron Newcomb. You know him if you have ever watched Twit. He's been on uh, This Week in Google, Twit, New Screensavers, yep. Know How, Floss. Floss Weekly. Uh, all about Android. Yes. What am I missing? You've done a couple of oh, uh, TNT. You've done TNT. I've done TNT. Uh, do you still do Before You Buy? I used to do Before yeah, You Buy. Oh, that's right. You were in Before You Buy. Uh, I haven't done the the Mac. I'm not an Apple guy or Mac guy at all uh, for various reasons. So I haven't been on any of those shows. Don't typically do Windows Weekly because I like to right. use Linux. Uh, I do use Windows, but I also like to use Linux. So anyway, there's a few shows I haven't been on. I've been on Gizfiz as well. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, you're, you're sort of our, our journeyman. That's you, right. You move from yeah. show to show. You just bring your wonderfulness. But, but of course, we have you here on Know How because you are a maker. Right. In heart, in spirit, and in reality, in, in action. Practice, you're, absolutely. You're, you're one of the few people who actually put your money where your mouth is because mm -hmm. you built a makerspace in Benicia. That's right. Yeah, it's a big makerspace. We've got um, CNC machines, 3D printers, uh, CAD CAM, which we're going to talk a little bit about today, CAD CAM programs. Uh, boy, we have just about everything there. Electronics, uh, we make uh, Raspberry Pis and gears and motors available to our members. Lots of stuff that people can tinker with. So, um, And you get 24-7 access. So uh, I, I, I know you've talked about this on some of the other Twitch shows, about what goes into making a makerspace, maintaining mm -hmm. a makerspace, and how people actually join a makerspace. But there, there are still people in our audience who think it's a great idea. They might mm -hmm. even have one near them, but they don't exactly know... It's like signing for a gym, where right. you don't want to go to the gym until you at least look a little competent in what you're doing at the gym. Right. Is it the same thing as a makerspace? What kind of experience do you need to go before you actually mm -hmm. pay your dues? Yeah, you don't need really any experience, at least in most makerspaces. Um, and there are different types of makerspaces. We should say there's community-based makerspaces like ours. Our, our dues are only $50 a month, so really, really low mm, okay. compared to other ones. Um, and then there are professional makerspaces or Tech Shop is one example of that. Right, Fab Labs. Right. These are commercial entities where you pay a lot more than that month. Usually it's more $125, $150 a month. Um, but they offer all the training and everything. You get a lot for your money, definitely, at those things. You get a lot for your money also at community maker spaces. So we do things. You don't have to know really anything because we do intro to welding. We do intro to machining. We do intro to CAD CAM. We do intro to 3, 3D printing. Uh, just enough to kind of whet your appetite or maybe let you know whether it's something you're going to be interested and actually you know, spending a lot of time learning about. Right, because there's, I mean, there's a lot that you can do at home. If you've mm -hmm. got a 3D printer, a decent 3D printer, even a bad 3D printer, right. really, you can marvel at some yeah. of your designs coming into reality. Absolutely. But I think every maker hits that point where they start saying, you know what? If I made this out of aluminum instead of PLA, this mm -hmm. would be incredible. Right. Or if I were able to mill this and not 3D print it, it would be so much stronger. Right. And that's when a makerspace makes sense because, exactly. yeah, a, a good 3D printer will cost you $1,000, but a good CNC is tens right. of thousands of Not dollars. to mention laser cutters, plasma mm -hmm. cutters, uh, uh, water cutters, things like that that get really expensive. Uh, how do you get your hands <clears> on that? I mean, you don't have an unlimited budget. We don't. Remember, we're a community makerspace. We're actually a nonprofit. 
Um, so we take donations and you get a tax write-off. We're a 501c3. Um, but that means we don't have a lot of resources. So one thing we do is we go out to the community, we try to raise funds, or we look for grant funding if we want to get, for example, a new laser cutter. Uh, we have to go out and look at the community and look for grant funding to be able to do that. Uh, there are lots of sources out there that you can look at if you're looking to start a community makerspace, like uh, go to your local town government. Right. See what kind of things they're interested in. It turned out our local town government was interested in sustainability, and they had some money set aside for sustainability programs. And so we decided, well, as part of our makerspace, we'll start doing sustainable uh, activities like um, sub-irrigated growing, planter gr growing, we'll do um, aquaponics, we'll do wind turbines, we'll do solar, we'll do all of that kind of stuff, which, which filled a gap that the town had, but also is able to get us some funding to be able to do that and open the space and pay a few months of rent. Well, um, Aaron, I, I think it's absolutely fantastic. Yep. I, think it's, I think it's wonderful that people like you want to create a safe space for people who are just curious, who, who think that they might want to do something. Right. Oh, uh, real quickly, we'll do it again at the end of the show, sure. but if they wanted to find out about your makerspace mm -hmm. in particular, where, where should they go? So just go to BenetiaMakerspace.org, BenetiaMakerspace.org, and you can see there's a link to our meetup there so you can see what kind of classes we offer. Uh, we try to do blog posts to let people know what's going on, but we're all really busy. Um, but you can see what kind of equipment we have, see some pictures and some videos and things like that. Fantastic. Okay. Now, because of the Benicia Makerspace <clears throat> and because of all the people that you've gathered who are like-minded individuals who like to create, mm -hmm. we've got a project that builds on what is probably the most popular project we've ever had on know-how. Way, way, way back in the double digits of know-how, uh, Ayaz and Leo okay. created a security camera out of an Android phone, an old mm -hmm. Android phone. Yep. Uh, now, that's kind of outdated. In fact, we get com people complaining that, oh, it's not the right thing. It doesn't, it's like, well, that's almost a four-year-old episode, right, so right. not so great. We wanted to bring you back on and actually have you update the project for us because mm -hmm. the technology has changed. It's become a lot simpler, and with the advent of things like 3D printers, we can now make much better devices. Right, yeah, so one problem with doing that, of course, is if you're gonna put your camera outside, mm -hmm. it's gonna be, number one, exposed to potential burglars or whoever it is you're trying to capture on camera. You know, they just bring a bat and gone, right? Uh, so your camera's exposed, especially to the elements. Um, you could put it in a window, but then you get glare and refre reflection and things like that. Um, so, there, so for a lot of those reasons, it's good to have a case uh, that you can print. And that allows you to do some other things I'll mention when we get a little bit further into the episode. All right, let's talk about the hardware first. What are the things they're going to need? Obviously, looking at this, uh, this workbench, they're going to need some kind of 3D printer. Because right. you, you've, you've made some very nice 3D printed parts here. This is exactly what you were talking about, where we have an enclosure for the camera, so it's, right. which is actually your phone. So it makes it a bit more secure. It protects it from the elements. It gives you much more mounting options. Mm -hmm. But what went into this project? It, going in, if, if I were to give them a parts list, what are the things they absolutely need to have? Right. So you already, you already, as you can figure out, I mean, phones come in all different shapes and sizes, right? Even the Nexus 6 and the Nexus 6P are different sizes. You would think, oh, they must be the same size. Nope, they're not. If you design a case for the 6, it's going to be too big for the 6P. So you are going to need, or at least for this project, we would recommend designing your own case to fit exactly the phone that you have. Um, and if you don't have a 3D printer, by the way, you can send that out to get 3D printed at somebody else's mm -hmm. Shapeways or mm -hmm. one of the other production houses, and they'll just ship you your part in a couple of days, which is great. Now, so, uh, something that they can do, though, is this part is basically universal. I mean, if, they were, right. to, if they were to take this yep. and then combine it with a resize box to fit their phone, exactly. they could take your STL files and use it as their own. And use it as their own, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't have to make this part necessarily. You just have to make the box to fit your phone. Um, the other thing you're going to need, obviously, is a phone. A phone. Um, in this this case, this is a little special. Uh, in fact, I had some difficulty getting the setup right before we started the show because I remembered the reason I use this phone. It looks great, right? Well, the <laughs> no, the, the touch. Uh, uh, what do they call it? The um, the uh, multi-touch sensor. The multi-touch sensor that sits behind the screen is actually defective. So that's why you use. So this. that's why I used okay. it. This is actually a Nexus. Uh, five, I believe, and uh, it used to be my wife's phone, and one day she came to me, she said, I dropped it, and now when I touch down here, it actually looks like it's touching up here, what do I do? I said, ah, I'll get you a new phone, I've got something I want to use that phone for. <laughs> um, but you can do this with just about any phone as long as it's fairly 
recent because it is going to be processing photos. So you don't want to go grab your G1, for example. Probably wouldn't work well for this project. But any phone that's uh, come out maybe, say, in the last two or three years should be fine. It's going to have enough horsepower to process the pictures um, and do some other things that you can do with the program. And I'll point those out in a little bit. But you are going to want to do this with an Android, not an it's iPhone. It's going to be an Android Windows because, phone. absolutely, because the, the type of applications that you can get for an Android for this particular thing, you're going to find are going to be, there's a lot more to choose right. from, a lot easier to use. You don't have to break your iPhone to, to get access to them. Um, and uh, the other thing you're going to need is a spare cable. So I don't know if you can see the black on black here, but there's a cable coming through that actually hooks in to keep the phone charged. And uh, Padre's setting off the motion sensor now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there's actually a, a, a a phone that goes, or a cable that goes in to keep the phone charged, obviously very important. It's got its own battery, but you can't run on battery forever, so you're going to need to charge it somehow. Um, and uh, there's also, you'll see, you know, maybe a few extra wires. We'll talk about what those are for in just a little bit. Hmm, okay, I like this. So a 3D printer or a way to get these files 3D printed. That's right. uh, what software did you use, by the way? We'll, we'll go over that in a bit, yep. but what, what did you use to create this? Uh, so I used uh, Fusion 360 by Autodesk. If you haven't used Fusion 360, it's really easy. Not free for everybody. I know you guys like free to Free for like 99.9% .9 Not Exactly, almost everybody, unless you're, unless you're selling something. So if you're a big business and you're using it to design parts that you sell, um, then you do have to pay for it. It's not as expensive as AutoCAD, um, but you still have to pay for it. Uh, otherwise, for hobbyists, tinkerers, educators, or educatees, <laughs> if, you're, if you're a student, um, it's completely free. Um, and you can use it, you know, basically as much as you want. There's no restrictions. It's not like a one-year trial period right. or something like that. You, you basically can use it for free forever um, until you start making money. So I think that's a fair deal. Fantastic. Uh, we will get right into the project, but before we get there, let's go ahead and take a break to thank the first sponsor of this episode of Know How. Hey, developers. I know at some point you all need to get paid, right? I mean, it's nice to give things to the world. It's nice to, to take your imagination, your skill, and to create something that's beautiful, that's perfect, that's just the way you want to present. But if you're going to continue to do that, if you're going to continue to make, if you're going to continue to develop, at some point you're going to want to monetize it just to get enough to keep giving people your all. And that's why we're so happy to have Braintree as a sponsor of know-how. Now, Braintree is a full stack payment solution, a way for you to integrate payments into your service, into your app, with a minimum amount of code. Now, Braintree knows that by next year, maybe even next week, there could be a new way to pay. So what they don't want to do is they don't want to give you an integration that's going to be continually updated, that's going to be needed to, to be recoded every single time there's a new way to pay for services and goods. And that's why they give you an API that supports so many different languages and so many different operating systems, a way for you to easily get secure payments where you need them. Their full stack payment platform is easily adaptable to whatever the future holds, so you can accept the next Bitcoin, the next Apple Pay, maybe even both. Now, it'll let you accept everything from Pounds to PayPal to that next big innovation from any device with just that one integration. And when a new payment method does come along, all you have to do is update a few lines of code and you're good to go. What it means to you is that you're going to have no more late nights, no more complicated recoding, no more stress about staying ahead of the curve. Brain tree payments is here to help. If you're trying too hard, you're probably not using Braintree. Now, Braintree gives you simple, secure payments, code that you can integrate quickly, a code that supports Android, iOS, and JavaScript clients, SDKs in .NET, Node.js, Java, Perl, PHP, Python, Ruby, elegant code with clear documentation so that you can take your fate into your own hands. Folks, Braintree gives you an easy way to accept multiple payment types with one integration. Integrating it into your app is as easy as inserting a few lines of code. If you do want to accept payments, if you want an easier way to work this into your app or service, you owe it to yourself to try Braintree. Learn more at braintreepayments.com slash knowhow. That's braintreepayments.com slash knowhow. And we thank Braintree for their support of knowhow. All right, Aaron, I've got myself my phone. I've got myself my 3D printed pieces. Show me what you needed to do to make this work. Right, so should we start with uh, taking a look at the case? Let's look we... at the case. Okay, let's take a look at making the case. Uh, I'm just gonna show you a very quick walkthrough. Okay. This is not even as much as we go through in our <laughs> okay. 101 training for this in the makerspace. But I do wanna show you uh, kind of some basic steps that you're gonna go through and really how easy this is, especially when you're making a rectangular box 
you know, it, it couldn't get almost any easier. It's a box in a box. So let's take a look at Fusion 360 real quick, and we'll start something up. So the first thing, the way Fusion 360 works, which is why I recommend it for most people, is it starts with a sketch, a sketch. So just like you would draw on a piece of paper, we're going to create a sketch. We're going to create it on this plane. You can do X, Y, or Z planes. And then that's going to give you, you know, a flat surface to work off. We're basically going to create a 2D sketch and turn it into a 3D box. Okay. So let's start by doing a rectangle. Um, one thing before we get into this uh, we should mention is you're going to have to know the dimensions of your phone, right? So I've got a phone here, um, and there's a handy tool, if our viewers, most of our, your viewers are probably aware of this. Uh, this is a digital, there I am, digital That's caliper. That's way more accurate than a tape measure. Digital caliper. Don't use a tape measure for this. You're <laughs> going to be disappointed. Uh, so get a digital or even a, an analog uh, dial caliper is fine. That's going to be very accurate. And what you're going to be able to do is take your phone, take your dial caliper, and you, as you open up the caliper, you're going to be able to take very specific measurements like this. You hold up your phone, close this, and I can tell that this is... You get a is, readout at the top. You get a readout at the top, and it tells you, oh, this is exactly, even with my case on, this is exactly 88 millimeters, right? So that's the first thing you're going to do. Remember that, Padre, I'm holding you to that. 88. 88. And then you can take the other, whoop, this is actually a little bit bigger than my caliper goes, but we'll just call this 155 millimeters for now. Might need to get a bigger caliper if you're trying to do this for a tablet or a, or a uh, um, iPhone 7 or something like that. Uh, so we'll call that 155 millimeters. So first, take accurate measurements. These things are not expensive, by the way. They cost maybe uh, 20 bucks at the most. I think I got this for $12 off Amazon with Prime Shipping. So don't don't think, oh, I can't buy that or I can't afford that kind of tool. You can. This is really cheap. You'll, well, you'll save that much and just oh, waste filament. The first time you use it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So we've got our measurements. Let's go back to Fusion 360 and we'll make our box. So here's, all I'm going to do is click and drag. There we go. Click and drag. And it doesn't really matter what my dimensions are at first because I'm, it's going to give me the option to change those. So we said this was 155 millimeters. Whoops. Hello, Tony. Forgot to turn off my notifications. Uh, so we said this was 155 by what, Padre? 155 by 88. 88. You can just hit tab, 155. Now we've got a basic box that we can work with. But the important thing to remember is uh, we're actually going to make another box because we need to uh, think of it as a top-down view of whatever you're designing. So this is our inner part of the box. But as you know, as, as we're uh, building this thing, we need to have the, you know, we need to build the case. We need to build the mm -hmm. outside of it as well. So I'm going to hit enter on that and I'm going to build another box around it. So we're going to do another rectangle. This is going to be the outside of the box. Again, click and drag or you can just use, uh, put in the dimensions manually. It's up to you. Yeah. We, we do this a lot with uh, Tinkercad, which yep. is, that's the online version that we, we've been using so that people can have a very free, very easy to access tool. And essentially, it's playing with negative space. You right. create a box, and then you hollow out the space inside that yep, you need. Yep, exactly, by extruding or cutting. Mm -hmm. Yep. And this is very much the same way. Uh, so once you're done with your sketch, you just hit Stop Sketch. Very intuitive. And now you can see that our sketch is laid out in 3D space. We can actually select. Zoom in a little bit here. We can select the space where we want to extrude from here. Um, and all we're going to do is extrude up by basically the height of the box that we want. In this case, let's call it 10 millimeters just for fun. So just an example, 10 millimeters. And as you can see, as I put in the 10, it adjusts based on whatever I put in. So I can change that to 15, see what it looks like. 15 looks good. Let's go with 15. Hit enter. And there's the outside of our box. Um, now we also need a bottom to the box. So I'm going to go turn on the sketch again and do the same thing with that middle portion of the, uh, the original rectangle we made. And we're going to say we want this to be three millimeters thick. Hit enter, and that's it. And if I pull back from this, you'll see uh, that we basically have a box. Um, and we can actually play with this in 3D space if we want to. Um, so basically that easy, you can also do things, I'm not going to go into it for time's sake, but you can do things like you can put in screw holes and right. you can put in little things to hold your phone at a certain angle or whatever you want to do. Um, I just wanted to give the viewers a, an idea of how easy this actually is. A lot of people think computer-aided design, computer-aided drafting, I can't do it. It's too complicated. And really the tools now have gotten so easy. Uh, just about anybody can do this, even using a Tinkercad, which you guys use right. a lot, right? right? And then when you're done with this, you just go to the make button. 
Uh, we're not going to send this to a 3D printing utility. We're just going to get the STL file. So you go to, uh, to make, you select the body from your drawing that you want to print. You say OK, put in a few details, and hit Save. And it's going to save that for us. Now I can take that file that it just created over to my slicer uh, for your particular printer um, and feed that in and print it out. And Turn you're done. Turn the G code and you're good to go. Can't get any simpler than that. Now, a lot of people do ask us why it is that we, we use Tinkercad mm -hmm. instead of something like Fusion 360. Yep. Because Fusion 360 is actually really, really nice. I mean, it's got some features there that I'd love to have in Tinkercad. Yep. However, uh, the reason why we've been using Tinkercad is because it is, it's got such a low barrier to entry. Right. Even something like 360, when people first start it up, you get, it's very easy just to go, I don't know what this is, I don't right. understand that. Tinkercad, it looks like Paint, mm -hmm. Microsoft Paint yep. for 3D. That's right. Uh, but I will say that once you start getting comfortable with Tinkercad, you go over to Fusion 360 and you'll start saying, oh yeah, okay, it's all the same skills, I just have new tools that can make those compound shapes a right. little easier. That's right. That's exactly right. In fact, I would say Fusion 360 sits somewhere in between. So you got Tinkercad down here, Fusion 360 here, and then something like AutoCAD yeah. or SolidWorks is probably way up here. That's what you get paid for, if, or you study in college. You study and learn how to use those types of tools because they're very complex and they have their own uh, specific way to use them. And yeah. so that people make money because they know how to use those tools effectively. And Autodesk actually does make those tools free for students. Yeah. So a lot of our audience would be able to get them for free. Mm -hmm. But again, having a free tool and knowing how to use it is right. completely different. That's right. And I would say, you said Tinkercad's low barrier to entry. I'd say this is eh, maybe medium. Yeah, barrier yeah, to entry. yeah exactly. It'd be a Tiny good bit. step up from Tinkercad. Once you can use Tinkercad to make shapes that are not just boxes, mm -hmm. but maybe boxes with a couple of compound curves, right. maybe it's time to go to 360. Yeah, take a look at it. All right. So I've got my 3D case. And by the way, you've printed this incredibly thick. If you go to the, the side camera, I normally top out at about three millimeters. It's yep. as big as I want to make because I, I feel like it's just too thick. That's crazy thick. Yep. Why, why so much filament? Five millimeters, and the reason it's five millimeters is because it's mounted outside. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of weight being supported um, by this little gimbal here. So once I get this out there and I get the screws, uh, you can see there's like little screws, mounting screws here. Can I get that in frame? There we go. Little mounting screws. Once I get this mounted, to my wall, put the mounting screws in here. Depending on the phone, the size of the phone and the weight of the phone you have, there's gonna be a lot of pressure on all this plastic. Does it need to be five millimeters? No, I didn't want to redo it though. Right. I figured if I'm gonna do it once, or in this case I did it probably about five times, <laughs> that's what 3D printers are for, but I said, you know what, I don't wanna mount it on the wall and have it fall off, so I made it five millimeters, three millimeters would right. probably be fine for you this. Know, what I've done, if I do need a little bit of extra strength, sometimes I'll, I will honeycomb the surface. Mm -hmm. So I, I will add voids so that it's it's using less filament, right. but you still have those vertical horizontal That's support right. members. Yeah. It gives a lot of the same strength and you can use maybe yep. half as much material but uh, yeah, five millimeters of solid plastic. That's, that's definitely not solid. So this is using a 10% info, I think. Oh, okay. 10% that's info, that so that means the, the uh, uh, if you've used 3D printers before, you're, right. you're aware of this. But if not, that basically means the way I have my settings set up in my slicer, I'm using the first two layers are solid, mm -hmm. and then everything in between is honeycombed up to the top two layers, and then the top two layers are solid. And I don't know if you can pick that up. You can actually see you, the yeah, honeycomb. Yeah, you can see it a little bit. Can you see it? So you can see through those top two layers to where that honeycomb shape is. So yeah, solid for the first two and the last two layers, but all of the probably 15 or 20 layers in between there, um, that's all honeycomb. So you're using very little filament, even though it looks like I've used a lot. Okay, that's the enclosure. That's the enclosure. Let's get to the hardware. Right, so I've got my phone here. Um, uh, one of the things that I did, I told you I'd, talk to, I'd show you what those wires were for later. Uh, one of the things you can do is you can very easily strip off the uh, power wires. We're not using data for this project, by the way. So what you can do is you can strip off the, the power wires and run those over to an LED. Now, this is probably going to go off when I move it. Let's see. No, it's not. So there's the LED um, that I put right in the middle. What this is is it just gives uh, maybe would-be uh, burglars uh, a little bit of an indication that, hey, I'm watching you. Um, I can see what you're doing. And by the way, even if your um, uh, phone is, is turned off, ran out of battery, isn't working. As long as it's plugged in, that LED is going to be uh, active. Right. And so it's going to be, you know, warding off those. Yeah, go ahead and plug it in. Yeah, let's plug it in and see wait, what wait, happens. There we go. Now plug it in. So as soon as I, as soon as I plug that in, that LED is going to come on. I know it's, it's kind of bright and the camera can't really oh, pick up the red. You can see it. That's um, a 5-volt LED, right? 
It's not. It's actually 3.6 standard, mm. standard LED uh, that you get off from any store, online store, or anything. And I added a resistor, always important, yeah. to lower the 5 volt voltage down to 3.6. And there's calculators online for people that want to learn how to do that. All right. Okay. So once I've got my enclosure, I've yep. got my uh, sort of go away light That's right. in the front of the enclosure. I now need to start worrying about my phone. Uh, again, right. we, we are going to be running this off of an Android. It might be running off of an older Android phone, something that someone's got tossed away in a drawer. Mm -hmm. What are the things they're going to need to be able to turn that Android into a security camera? Right. So there's really two things that you need here. You need the application itself. And if you want to do motion sensing, things like that, you're going to need an application that supports that. And there's lots of them online. I'm going to tell you about the one I picked in a minute. Uh, but uh, there's lots of good ones online. Some are simple, some are more complex, like the one I chose for various reasons. Uh, but you're going to want something probably that does motion sensing so that when someone walks by the camera, it automatically goes off. Um, I find it useful. Uh, well, kind of like the Ring. The Ring's a sponsor, right? The mm, Ring uh, of course. Uh, doorbell. Um, you might want something that does notification so that when you're away on vacation or whatever, um, you get a notification every time that UPS driver comes up, and hopefully that's all it is. Uh, they come up and they drop off a package. You can see that they dropped off a package. Call your neighbor and say, hey, UPS just dropped off a package. I can tell by the by the photo. Can you go pick up the package for me? Uh, things like that. So you want to have it do motion sensing and probably notification at least. And then the other thing you're going to want on here is an application that you can get into your phone. Remember, this is going to be in a case, right? So if you want to change something on your phone, you don't want to have to run out, yeah. take it off the wall, unscrew it, get into it and use it. You actually want something that you can control your device remotely with. Now, are you talking about some sort of remote desktop or is this a command line interface into the module you're going to be running on top of it? So this is actually a remote desktop application. And what I use for that is AirDroid. I don't okay. know if you've yeah. ever used AirDroid, yeah. but AirDroid is a simple application that allows you to control your devices remotely. It also does things like notification from your phone to your desktop, kind of like push bullet mm -hmm. if you want to do that. And you can control multiple devices, and um, it's uh, a great little app to do that. So what I do, and that works double for me because, remember, I can't touch the screen on this phone because... <laughs> So uh, it, even if you could pull it down off the wall, you still couldn't touch the screen. Uh, right, I couldn't do anything with this screen. So that's another reason I run AirDroid is to get uh, to get into the phone. How did you get things. AirDroid installed on it if you couldn't touch the <clears> screen? <throat> so, you know, if I'm really careful and reset the phone a couple times, eventually I can get it so that I can uh, uh, get it to recognize my, my input. So you just needed so it once. I just, just needed yeah. it once. And now that it's set up and it's on the right Wi-Fi network, it's good to go. Now, let me ask you this. Are, are you using the, the built-in connectivity modules for, for Android. It's not custom. So in other words, no. it's using the standard Wi-Fi. Exactly. So, so I could, theoretically, I could put something like a prepaid SIM from T-Mobile into mm -hmm. this thing. And, and even if somehow my Wi-Fi network went out, it could still maintain connected. Absolutely. It could still send me notifications and, and images. You could do all of that if you wanted. I just don't happen to want to pay for it. Right. But yeah, I took the SIM out. But you could absolutely just run it with a SIM in there like a regular phone. And the thing about using a phone in this case is, unlike other projects that I know you do on this show mm -hmm. and I work on, like Raspberry Pi and Arduino, you have to add a module and then you have to program we're, the Wi-Fi Yeah, we're taking and dumb and devices and making them smart. You're taking, taking a, a smart device a and making kind of dumb. A smart device and, and <laughs> turn it into a single purpose thing, but we're taking advantage of all the built-in stuff. So we're taking advantage of the built-in camera, we're taking advantage of the built-in Wi-Fi, taking advantage of the built-in wireless uh, network that's in there. Um, things like, you know, hooking up a standard uh, uh, USB cable. We don't have to actually solder a cable and hook it up to a power system. You can just use the regular power supply off the shelf. So we're taking advantage of all that goodness that comes built into a smartphone and turning it into our advantage for the motion detection security camera. Okay. When we come back, we're going to take them step by step. This is Sounds this good. is the moment of, of truth. <laughs> they've got their uh, maybe they've got their their enclosure. Maybe they've just got an Android phone and they want to set it up to make sure it's going to work. Yep. This is an update to the most popular know-how episode we've ever had. But first, let's go ahead and thank a sponsor that, uh, well, I think uh, is just naturally tied into know-how. Oh, we all have devices that we need to fix. We all have projects that we want to make. We all have those little gadgets and gizmos that need a little bit of me time. Well, when you're thinking of me time for your technology, you should really think no further than iFixit. iFixit is the name for the DIY and the maker in each every and every single one of us. Not only do they give us the latest and the greatest tools, not only do they give us a complete list of all the parts for the most popular devices that we might be trying to repair or upgrade, but iFixit gives us thousands upon thousands of free repair guides. It's really your one-stop shop 
for all your making needs. Now, iFixit is not just your complete DIY repair solution. They give you those 21,000 free step-by-step -step repair guides. They give you more than 80,000 solutions. They give you a huge inventory of replacement parts, and they give you the community to make it all work. Now, let's talk about this. This is their all-new ProTech Toolkit, and it's gorgeous, completely reimagined. It's just as rugged and portable as the previous one, but it's even easier to get your tools out and to get fixing. Now, it includes the new 64-bit driver kit, which replaces the former 54-bit driver kit. It's got a more durable ca case engineered without hinges or latches that can break off. It uses magnets, which means everything is held to the roll by magnets inside the back of the fabric. It makes it much easier to remove your bits, which, by the way, are angled this time so that you can get them in and out and get done more quickly. More bits means fewer repair roadblocks. It means easier to use longer lasting and cooler tools. It means that you can get to the, the exact procedures that you need to get to when you need to get them. Now it also includes precision ESD safe tweezers, a pair of reverse tweezers, a wide variety of opening tools and picks to safely work on tablets and smartphones, a suction cup for display assembly remover, a metal spudger, plastic smudgers, uh, spudgers, and iFix its own rubber handed Jimmy pry tool. It is a complete all in one kit for everything that you might need to open, upgrade, <laughs> or take apart. Now, the best part, everything is backed by iFixit's lifetime warranty. Buy it because it's awesome. Buy it because Brian and I and Aaron now use it on know-how or don't. And even then, you'll still get access to all of the free repair resources on iFixit.com. Folks, you owe it to yourself to try iFixit. Grab an all-new ProTech Toolkit and get going on your next fix, hack, or build. Just head over to iFixit.com slash twit. That's iFixit.com slash twit and use the code know how at checkout to save five dollars on your purchase of ten dollars or more and we thank iFixit for their support of know how okay enough dancing around That's this right. they want to see the procedures what do i need to do to make this become a security camera right so first let's talk a little bit about the the uh getting the phone into the case and the in the uh hardware real quick okay really simple uh basically all you need to do we mentioned this before you're going to break out a couple of these wires uh, from, uh, you're basically going to tee into the power wires, run those over to your LED, make sure you solder on the appropriate uh, uh, resistor, mm -hmm. cover them up with shrink wrap, and then if you've designed your case right, yeah, I know, Sorry, keeps, I, I keep, some going, <laughs> keep <laughs> sensing the motion, I should really turn that off, but it's kind of fun. You know it's working if you hear that sound. Um, uh, and then, you know, if you've designed your case right, everything should fit in then you can mount it on your house or whatever. So the actual assembly is super simple uh, as long as you've done your work ahead of time and made the case. Um, now, loading the software, let's talk about the software real quick. Um, so you've got AirDroid loaded up on this? I've got AirDroid. Let's go ahead and look at that first. So uh, you can see there's AirDroid running, and it's giving me the desktop exactly how I have it over here on the actual phone. Um, and you can see my notifications. I can swipe up on this to open up the phone. Here's the app we're running, by the way, motion detector, so I can open that up if I wanted to. Um, there it is. Um, and you see I've got it, the detector turned on, so if I wanna stop it from dinging, uh, I can go ahead and hit that button and we'll stop it. Uh, so we can take a look at some of these settings. Um, so yeah, that's AirDroid. AirDroid's really simple. It allows you to do backups. Um, you can take a look at your device. There's the backup tab. Uh, there's your device tab. Um, you can you can see I've got my Nexus 6. Is this, is this a paid app? or? Um, you, there you do have a paid version, I believe, I, but I'm not using it. I'm just using the free. There's okay. some additional features you can get from AppDroid if you want to uh, by getting the free app. But a lot of the features, are the, sorry, the paid app, but a lot of the features that you get, including this thing they call Air Mirror, which is the desktop, remote desktop function, come from the free uh, version. Navigate around and show them so then the side-by-side -side they see the control. Uh, sorry, what? So, like, drop out to the, uh, the the home screen. Click on home. There you go. Just so that they can see it and navigate. Oh, actually, it turned off. Come back. Uh, yeah, it's on. Uh, it's on off. Let's go ahead and pull it out. Turn it back on. Come on display. <laughs> Maybe it's just to say, hey, you know what? You're connected externally. I don't need to be on yeah, anymore. Yeah, it might be. Um, I may have turned the display off, so you can't see you can't see it side by side. But trust me, it works. <laughs> if I was doing this, you'd be able to see it. Uh, unfortunately, the display just turned off, though. So, um, uh, yeah. So this is actually so this just turned off. Let's open it back up again. And how do I make sure that that app loads up every time the phone is on? Because I mean, it may restart. It may do an automatic system mm -hmm. update. 
I don't want to have to open up my enclosure just to make sure that this is running. Right. So there's actually uh, in the app itself, if I was to open up the AirDroid app, there's a setting that says okay. run, run on boot. And okay. likewise, with the other app we're going to talk about now is the Motion Detect app. It also has a run on boot up um, setting in it. So you can go ahead and... Uh, okay. Take us through the setup. Yeah. Let's go through the Motion Detector first, the Motion Detector software. Um, so there's uh, just a ton of options here. I mean... It's amazing all of the things you can do with this. The um, uh, This is for local or remote preview. So if you were doing, uh, you can set this up so you can do a preview remotely. Yeah. Oh, there it goes. Uh, yeah, thank you. That works a lot better. <laughs> um, uh, you can set it up for local or remote preview. Um, mostly you're going to want to set this up as local, but if you wanted to do a remote preview, you can connect to the app remotely and see a preview of what's on the screen. Um, it allows you to do things. This is, for example, I'm telling it here, I want to capture pictures. Um, you can choose how many pictures every time the motion detection gets triggered, how many pictures do you want to take? And I think I have this set up for four or five. Um, you can also say, uh, do I want to save this in my gallery, the local gallery on the phone? Do I want to print the time and date on every frame? I recommend doing that because if you ever actually need to use it, let's say something gets stolen from your house, you need to go to the cops, then you have a date stamp, a date stamp right, right on the on photo. The file, right. Exactly. Um, you can also set the, uh, uh, the format of the picture. You can do XIF fields. So you can get really complicated with this or you can keep it fairly simple. But what I like about this is it has options for almost anything that you want to do in the software. You can do time lapse. Um, you can change your quality. Maybe you have a, a phone that's not quite as modern, and you might need to bump down the quality in order to uh, uh, to get it to work well for you. Now, um, I mean, uh, my ideal would be to save to the phone and then have it automatically update to Google Plus, because mm -hmm. then that gives me complete access to my security system, no matter where I am, no matter what computer I'm on. Exactly, and I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. You, <laughs> you're, you're actually right right where we need to be, uh, because they also have an upload feature. I love so this. So you can upload this. What I do is I upload this to my storage system at home. Mm. I keep it on a separate drive, and then I sync that drive with Google Plus on my desktop. So the, they first go to my local drive, or my a remote drive on my local How PC. How fast does that happen? Really fast. So, it, like, even if they try to steal the, the oh, phone, yeah. I'll, the, you, you've as at least as, got a couple of picks. Oh, yeah. As soon, okay. as, as soon as you walk up, I've timed this thing. As soon as you walk up, with, with in less than half a second, there's at least two photos on the <laughs> system. So, even if I'm coming up with a baseball bat, you're going to get that picture of, you know, the guy doing this with a good, good view of his face. Um, so, yeah, you can totally upload these. Uh, um, and that's the way I would do it if I was going to use Google Drive, is I would upload them um, to a local drive first and then have that PC or laptop upload them to, to, Google, to Google Drive. Um, you can also set authentication so that people can't get in and mess with your system. Right. You can set a timeout mm -hmm. so that after a certain period, you know, uh, let's say you turn this thing on and then you don't want to capture pictures of yourself looking at it turning, turning the camera on, you can set a timeout to say after 10 seconds, then start taking pictures. Um, the other really cool thing, and I hope I can find this here, is um, there's a setting that allows you to, come on, uh, I may not be able to find it in time. This is the post, let's go back. Uh, there's a setting in here that allows you to uh, choose where you want the the area where you want the motion to be in the frame. Oh, right, right. So, so you, it shows you the frame and then you can say only, only motion detection Only in this area, this area, right. It'll only monitor for motion in that area. And that's really helpful because you don't want to capture yep. dogs running around or cars going by your house or... Um, you know, lots of other things that could or, be going Or on. like if you have this in the front door and it's looking out from the front door, you right. say cut off here because this is my property line. I want to know if there's motion on my property, but I don't care if there's motion out on the street. That's right, exactly. Or maybe you've got a tree in your front yard and there's a lot of wind, right? Right. You want to block that out because that tree is going to be triggering it. Now, there's also a sensitivity threshold as well mm -hmm. that says only take it if there's more than this much of the picture has changed. So you can adjust even for things like the tree that might be waving a little bit, but it's still going to catch that person that walks fully through the frame. Um, can, I, can I also make it daylight sensitive? Because I know a lot of these motion sensing cameras will get set off by a cloud passes by and suddenly right. the entire picture turns darker. That's right. And there is daylight sensitivity as well. Uh, mine still goes off unfortunately, because I've got automated lights that come oh, on right. at night. That's just too fast. And, yeah. and what happens is when the lights come on, they, 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 they come on, off, on, off, because the sensor hasn't decided whether it's 
mm-hmm. night or day, you know, there's a threshold there, and when that happens, that sensor goes ding, 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 ding. Um, so I, and unfortunately, that does trigger my phone, uh, my system at home. Um, but you can, again, I could just move that uh, little capture box over a little bit, take out the light, and then that wouldn't trigger it. All right, all right. So I've got all my settings, and yep. this is wonderfully uh, easy for me to install. It's yep. basically an app I just download from. You just download, from the set Play it up Store. how you want. Yep. Okay. And this is this. Uh, let's go back over to the motion. I want to uh, make sure that this, if this is paid or not. I think it is. I think there's a paid version of this app. Um, I'd say if you're going to be using this as a security camera, at least pay for the app. Yeah, pay for the app. You're going to get some really good. Uh, tools. Here's the sensitivity, as you can see, the 70, the set for 75 here. Uh, some of the other screens. Here's the. Uh, let me show you the box. There's a p- good picture of it here. There it is. So that's what I'm talking about. Here's the, the the. You can go into this setting. You can see the live picture, and then you can draw a box around mm-hmm. where you want it to capture. So that's good. I'm glad they had it there, as I wasn't able to get to it. Um, and then it can do the other thing that it can do is it can it can play an alarm sound or some sort of sound out of your ringtones. It can actually play that. So you heard mine going off earlier. Um, uh, you can absolutely do that. And uh, if you want a, a big alarm sound going off, you know, to scare people away, you could do it. Um, I would say don't do that. <laughs> That's my <laughs> recommendation because, like, every time my kids come in and out of the door, going back and forth to school, it goes off, and I really don't want to annoy the neighbors that much. Uh, but you could do that. I just got a simple notification that lets me know from the other room, hey. There's somebody at the front door. Is that UPS? Am I expecting something? I don't know. Now, how do, can I access this remotely? I mean, aside from using AirDroid mm-hmm. uh, from an internal PC, which is what I want, obviously I'm not going to put the phone on the internet because, well, especially if it's an older Android phone, it probably still has a couple of vulnerabilities right. like stage fright that yeah. will never be patched. Yeah. But how do I access the images coming off of this? Do I just have to wait for the notifications? Do I just have to look at the uploaded pictures? Or is there a way for me to actually get in and, say, reset something? There is a way for you to get in and monitor remotely, but that's all it lets you do. It okay. doesn't let you change settings and do all that. So that's why we have the uh, remote desktop application, the right. AirDroid setup. Because you can't really change things and change the settings. But there is a mode where you can actually go in and see the live picture that's going on right now. Um, and you can have it set up to email you with that live picture so that you know right away. And you know what? It, it's better this way. Because if mm-hmm. you do need to do serious remote administration, right. the only way you should really be doing that is VPNing into the network so it looks as if you're actually sitting on the local segment. That's right. And then you use AirDroid to get into the camera. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Let's let's do the final setup because we're running out of time, but I want to show them what this actually looks like when it's it's fully set up. When it's fully set up? Happy. Yeah. yeah. So all, all you do... Uh, all we do, I've got little holes in here. This is something that you can do when you're designing this uh, uh, with your 3D printer. You have a smaller hole here and a bigger hole here, and you just put that down and screw it in. I think I left my screwdriver over there. I got one over here. This looks, it looks like a lot like a rear view mirror. I'm wondering if I could replace my rear view mirror with, uh, with an Android phone. Yeah, you totally Probably can. not the most practical thing. Yeah, I mean, the cops may pull you over. They might not like that. If you're that. watching Know How on your... Uh, no, no, I'd be watching Adventure <laughs> Time or well, it's a Bob's Burgers. I'm big into Bob's Burgers right like now. A, I, I know over in Europe, a lot of the taxi cabs do it that way. They have a, the screen uh, right by We there. just got back from Germany, and I'm pretty sure the taxi cabs don't actually look at the road. Yeah. So here's what it looks like. So I've got this little gimbal. This part mounts to the wall, so that would be, let's say this is a wall. And then you that can just tighten there. this up when you're... When uh, you get this pointed the right direction, uh, you, can, you can just tighten, put screws in these holes. They're designed the same ways as the, as the other ones are. And you can point it wherever you need to point it, and you're good to go. And then you also have to, of course, feed your cable through. So you need to have some sort of access from the wall or a box or something like that on the outside of your uh, house with power in it so that you can feed your cable right through there and plug it in. Um, oh, I need to tie this thing to a solar panel and a battery. Yeah, that definitely. Awesome. Yeah, you yeah, can keep it up all the go. time. One last thing before we go. You'll notice there are some of you uh, that, that have been watching this have noticed there's a big hole here for the camera. And that's fine for the built-in camera. But the reason I designed it slightly oversized and the reason I designed it no, so deep... No, you didn't. Really? Was so that you could take wide-angle <gasps> lens. That's and okay. I haven't put these on there yes. in a while, so we'll have to see. Let's get them out here. See if we can find one that's... Uh, the right size. I don't know. I've got these all apart. But yeah, you could take a wide-angle lens like this, or actually like this, if I put it together. Which is what you want, because the lens on a camera phone is typically not not wide. It, it's I mean, it's you'd be you surprised. Got, what, you know what? I, when I was designing this before I actually tested it, um, I thought I was going to need this, and it turns out I didn't. <laughs> it was actually fine. So I've got this wide-angle lens here. Um, but if you do need it, you could take this, and it should fit if I did it right. In my there we go. 
fits exactly <laughs> flush with the box. Um, and again, just having that little camera up there when someone comes up and they see a lens like that, you yeah. know, they're going to think twice about breaking into your house or stealing your mail or whatever it is. Um, so it's all again, about not being the lowest hanging fruit. Don't be the lowest hanging fruit. And even if this thing dies, you still got a nice glowing red light uh, that tells people, hey, I might want to might want to watch out. They may have a HAL 9000 at that. Ha point. Has this been recording pictures? Can we take a look at any of the pictures? Uh, it, we can't because it's actually trying to send them to my oh, server at right. home. Oops. And we're on a different network. Yeah. So I should have I should have saved that uh, beforehand. I could have pulled one up. But uh, yeah, so they're actually good quality. They're actually good quality pictures, but it all depends on the quality of the camera in your phone. Aaron, thank you so very much. Again, you bet. What, what software did I need? I needed AirDroid and then AirDroid the, the and uh, Motion Detector. Motion Detector motion is the app. Detector. Motion Detector Pro um, is the app, and I'd highly recommend it. I actually test drove uh, three or four different apps before I set this mm -hmm. thing up and had it running. So I went took took all of these apps through their paces, and this is the one that I was a the most reliable, had all the features I wanted and more, um, and was actually pretty easy to set up. Aaron Newcomb, and that's the way you're going to turn your old Android phone into a security camera. Aaron, thank you again for being on. We're going to yeah. have you on time and time again. Yeah. Any chance I get, I'd love to get a real maker into the studio. And, uh, well, thank you, sir. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, this is my wheelhouse, so I'm glad to come on you know, anytime and talk about this stuff. This is fun. Now, if they wanted to find out more about this project, mm -hmm. uh, maybe if they wanted to get the STL files, find out what you're doing with the latest provision of this, where should they go? Well, first of all, I'll, I'll put the STL files um, in the uh, show notes. Mm -hmm. So they'll have links to the STL files. Um, I'm probably going to publish these uh, right after the show. I'll publish them to uh, Thingiverse, and they'll give you the link to Thingiverse. People can go out and find them. However... Like you said, like we said at the top of the show, unless you're running a Nexus 5, right. you're probably going to have to redesign this case. But if you just wanted to take a look at the STL files, get a closer look at the insides and you know how it all works, we'll definitely post those. Yeah, and, um, and again, at the very minimum, they can uh, they can do away with having to redesign right. a gimbal. Yeah, that's right. They yeah, just take yours not, and enlarge the plate. That's right. It's not intuitive, but you could actually just take that, just make the new front piece for your phone. You're good to go. Um, and you can also follow all of these projects, of course. You can follow me at Google+. Plus. It's where I post information about all these projects and give updates to how things are going. Fantastic. Again, Aaron Newcomb from the Benicia Makerspace, from This Week in Google, from Floss, from TNT, Know How, <laughs> Giz, Wiz, Before You Buy, I'm missing a couple. Yeah, just about everything. Yeah, just about everything. All about Android. Oh, folks, we know that this was a lot of information, but we don't expect you to memorize it. As Aaron mentioned, we are going to make all of this information available on our show page. Just go to twit.tv slash kh when you're there you'll be able to find all of our notes from all of our episodes including links to the various programs the bits of gear that we use including this fantastic little micrometer which i i got to pick myself up one they're telling me i can get one from harvard freight for about 10 bucks yeah so exactly i might need to get a few so yep. uh, they can wander and i'll still have some that's right but uh, again just go to twit.tv slash kh you'll also be able to find a subscribe link if you want to support the show if you want to see more know-how, that's the best way to do it. Make sure you get an audio version on your iPhone so you can listen to work, video versions on your Mac, your PC, your desktop, your laptop, your tablet. Whatever it is, whatever version you want, we're going to get it to you because we love you. Also, don't forget that we've got a big social media presence. Go to Google Plus and look for know-how. If you join our group, there's a slight approval process because we needed to keep out the spam accounts, you'll be able to have access to 10,000 plus Kitas, that's know-it-alls, the folks who make it all happen. From advanced folk who can give you all the answers that you're looking for, to newbies who maybe need your help to get past their first hurdle, their first uh, buy-in into the maker world. Again, just go to Google Plus and look for know-how. You can also find us on Twitter. You can find me at twitter.com slash Padre SJ. Aaron, where do they find you? Um, at Aaron Newcomb yeah. on uh basically all the social media networks. Yeah. And yeah. you can also find the third member of our crew, our director, uh, uh, Alex, I'm going to call him by his real name, Alex Gumpel at A-N-E-L-F-3. Again, twitter.com slash anelf3. Until next time, I am Father Robert Balliser. This is Aaron Newcomb. And now that you know how, go record it. <laughs>